thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you for bringing me here to India. Welcome to this session. Um, it's been a great pleasure to meet Shashi and, and to attend this the, the workshop I did last this week, which was very exciting. Conference being present out. Also, I had the opportunity yesterday to see a bit of Indian culture. The last three days, we visited the caves of Lanta and uh, Vera. Um, in some ways, that's food for the talk which I'm going to be giving today, which has got a lot to do with spirituality, at least towards the end of my discussion. Um, yesterday, perhaps a high point of our trip, we went to the Lerner Crater, um, about three hours' drive from Arangabad. And it was a marvel to see it. And it put me in mind, I mean, as someone who's interested in evolution, I couldn't but um, put, put a lot of different thoughts together. I, it was formed 50,000 years ago when a meteor banged into, from space into that part of India, um, blew this two kilometer mile uh, crater in the ground, and must have made the sky dark for, for months, perhaps even years to come. My daughter pointed out that. 50,000 years ago, um, human beings had just begun to enter India, coming from Africa, in the expansion of modern human beings. And so we can imagine the welcome they got when they arrived well, at, at Lorna, or whatever name they gave to it then, and found the place being uh, blown apart by a meteor. A um, meteor which was no doubt felt by their cousins living in, um, in France and in, and in Europe at the same time. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating to think about how our ancestors would have responded to an event like that. But well, we know how they've responded to it more recently, which has been by building temples all around. Um, of course, because it's, it gives people a sense of mystery and awe and the power of the universe. Um, and again, I'm going to talk about some of that later in this talk. But um, as Shashi said, my focus really is on consciousness. Um, it's not tremendously scientific talk today. Talk, but I'll, of course, be, it's informed by science, and I'll address some scientific issues as we go on. I want to talk about, as you see, about the magical qualities of consciousness, about how consciousness lights up the world for us um, and makes us feel special and transcendent, how consciousness creates the idea of the human soul, um, and even, as we'll see, of the immortal soul. But I don't want to go straight there. I want to start off where we all start, when we wake up every morning, um, with the experience of conscious sensation. I want to ask what it feels like to be a conscious creature living in the present. Let's turn the lights right down, actually. I've got so many good pictures to show you. The darker it is. I'm trying to have this one off, too. I've got plenty of light here. Yeah. Um, what's it feel like uh, to have your hair pulled uh, in, a, in a wrestle with your Friend. Never done, please. Never done, please. Oh, okay, can you see? All right. Yeah. Um, uh, well, what, what's, you know, auto roast your nose in front of the fire? I'd much, uh, can you see those from the back? Can you see these pictures? You probably can't. Can you not bring them right no, Maybe you can see. Or, of course, my human example. What's it like to run through the cold, wet waves? new theory of what sensation amounts to. Now to be clear about the words I'm using here, sensation is the way we represent our interaction with the stimuli that touch our body, the light in our eyes, or the sound of our ears, or the pressures on our skin. Sensation, as I'm using the term, is not the same thing as perception. Perception is, way, is the way we represent the world out there, the waves as such, or the fire as such. But sensation is something much more personal. It's the way we represent what's happening to me and how I, as a subject, evaluate it. The pain, let's say, the pain is in my toe, and it's horrible. The sweet taste is on my tongue, and it's sick. The red light is before my eyes, and it's stirring me up. It's as if, in having sensations, we're both registering the objective fact of stimulation and expressing our own personal bodily opinion about it. And indeed, as we'll see shortly, I think we are doing something just like that. But it's the way we do it which is so surprising. What we represent this bodily opinion as, where do these extra 
qualitative dimensions come from? Right? What can make the subjective present of consciousness seem so rich and deep, as if we're living in what I've called thick time? What can Kandinsky mean when he writes, color is a power which directly influences the soul. Color is the keyboard. The eyes are the hammers. The soul is the piano with many strings. Why do we say, at least in English, it's like something to be conscious? Why don't we just say it is something to be conscious? Again and again in philosophy now, the term of use is it's like something to be conscious. But is that because conscious sensations are like something? They actually can't be. Well, in asking these questions, we're up against what's become known as the hard problem of consciousness. And I probably don't need to tell most people in this room that this is a problem that some of our best philosophers have said that we're never going to be able to solve. The American philosopher, Jerry Fodor, tells us so almost every week, which is a typical uh, comment by him. We can't, as things stand now, so much as imagine the solution of the hard problem. The revisions of our concepts and theories that imagining a solution will eventually require are likely to be very deep and very uncertain. There's hardly anything that we may not have to cut loose from before the hard problem of consciousness is through with us. Well, Freud is right that we haven't been doing too well in imagining an answer. He's right that the problem can sometimes seem impossibly hard. But I think we should put the emphasis on that word, seem, because something to seem to have mysterious, inexplicable features doesn't mean that it necessarily really has them. And I'll explain what I mean by means of a well-known example. Suppose we would come across an object uh, like this, an object made of wood, let's say, lying on a bench, the so-called impossible triangle. A real object, not, a, not just a drawing, but something existing in, in the real world. Well, um, uh, it would seem to us, of course, to be a physical impossibility. But that doesn't mean we should throw away our physics books and cut loose from everything we know. We'd soon realize, of course, that it must be some kind of illusion. And sure enough, if we could only change our viewpoint, we'd discover that what we're actually looking at is the strange object shown here, an object carefully constructed to deceive us when we see it from just that one position where it takes on the perspective of the impossible triangle. As Sherlock Holmes said, once you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Well, I think that the truth about consciousness, if only we can see it from the right perspective, is that it is indeed a highly improbable bit of biological engineering, a clever trick played on us by nature, but one which really does have a relatively simple explanation. Well, so where to begin? What questions should we ask? Jerry Fodor, the philosopher, has had more to say. Nobody, he wrote, has the slightest idea what consciousness is, or what it's for, or how it does what it's for, to say nothing of what it's made of. Well, whatever you think of the nobody here, um, let's at least give it to him that these do look like rather good questions. What phenomenal consciousness is, what it's for, how it does what it's for, and what it's made of. And these, in fact, are the questions I'm going to use to structure my talk, at least the first half of it. Um, but I'm not going to give them equal weight, because what really excites me are some new ideas about what consciousness is for, its evolutionary function, which I actually mentioned in the introduction. And that will be the second half of the talk. The first half, I should say, is in a way the more difficult part, the second half is downhill all the way, so stay in there, uh, if, even if you find the first half more, rather more difficult. So let's start off. What is consciousness? Phenomenal consciousness and sensory consciousness. What kind of thing is the sensation of bread, or the salt taste of an anchovy, or the searing pain of a burn? Well, my answer is that it's a kind of magical recreation, a show that we lay on for ourselves inside our heads in, um, and in, in response to stimulation of our sense organs. We create something, an extraordinary artwork for our minds to look. A simulacrum of sorts, which tracks the interaction of our body with the outside world, the 
the sights and the sounds and the smells. And that means by forming a mental representation of this object which we create, we can indeed get a picture of what's happening to us. But this object we're creating does much more than merely track our interaction in an objective sense. It steeps it in subjectivity. It adds a personal dimension. It colors it with emotion. And on top of all that, it adds a mysterious dimension of temporal depth. So that now, when we form a representation of it, we don't simply discover what's happening. We get to have a picture that is like something, in a way I would explain. A picture that has indeed acquired some weird and rather wonderful properties, lifting us as a subject into a new level of reality, or as we might say, possibly even non-reality. Now, what about this theatre which I've shown you? Many of you will, will probably know that philosophers in recent years have mocked the idea of there being a theatre, uh, any such thing as an inner theatre, where our brain creates a simulacrum for another part of the brain to look at. Daniel Dennett has led the field in, in, in criticizing that view. He writes, the persuasive imagery of the Cartesian theater keeps coming back to haunt us, lay people and scientists alike, even after its ghostly dualism has been denounced and exorcised. Well, Dennett would be right, of course, to dismiss the idea that there's a place inside our head where one part of the brain creates a faithful replica of the, for another part of the brain to look at. Because, of course, you don't solve anything that way would lead to an infinite weakness. But despite its entry into the philosophical literature, I think that this use of the word theatre is entirely misleading. Replication is not what theatres are about, not real humanly created theatres. Instead, Real theatres. Real theatres are places where events are staged in order to comment in one way or another on the world, to educate, to persuade, and to entertain. Look at this audience. Clearly, they're there for the added value that the theatrical drama provides. Of course, they wouldn't show such rapt attention if there was simply a replica on show. I suppose it's not exactly a replica on show. Suppose this egg, please, is not bent, it's literally. Suppose this egg were to be magically transformed, <coughs> it were to be spread on toast, and now, as you looked at it, you saw an image of the Virgin Mary. Well, that would be something entirely different, and some of you may know that this particular piece of French toast sold for $3,000 on eBay. <laughs> um, so now, in the case of consciousness, what I'm suggesting is that one part of our brain is staging a magical show in order to influence the judgment of another part of the brain, to sell the world to us, and perhaps, again, to sell it for more than it's really worth. And what could that be for, biologically? In what respect do conscious creatures lead better or more successful lives? Well, I'll be coming to that. But first, let's ask how the spectacle, the spectacle of consciousness gets to have its spectacular properties. <coughs> In Frodo's terms, how does it do what it's for? If this is, what on, is what's on show, what can be going on backstage to create it? What strings are being pulled inside the brain? Well, my answer is that it must indeed be some kind of illusion, a trick played by one part of the brain on another. And now you'll see why I've chosen this impossible construction to illustrate the idea of its being like something to be conscious. Because, as we've seen, it's quite possible to construct something that looks like this. I hope you can see it, for real. Or if not that, she's holding the impossible triangle in her hand, you see. Um, but we can certainly create that for real. Um, and we can let's watch it being done. If you haven't seen this before, it's a very popular optical illusion called the Penrose Triangle or Tri Bar. But did you know you can make your own three dimensional? Make it up. Let's get to work. Now, by placing the cut and pull the paper on the floor and placing your camera or your eye at just the right angle, you can make a pen 
wait and see if we can adjust the sound of this up. I want you to hear some of my other videos. Does someone know how to increase the sound volume? You've probably seen this before. It's a very popular optical illusion called the Penrose Triangle or Tri Bar. But did you know you can make your own three dimensional one? Let's get to work. saw the, the Penrose Triangle, and here's what we've made backstage to create the illusion. And I'm serious, I think that this wonderful illusion-generating object provides just the kind of model we need for understanding consciousness. Here is something, a real physical object, that when seen from a special position is in the most literal sense like something. It's like something that it actually can't be like this. Magic, it seems. But still, as we've just seen, it's something that can be constructed by entirely mundane means. And if you can do that with paper and scissors, just imagine what natural selection could have done with all the resources of the brain. And let's note that the crucial thing is that we, as subjects, are seeing this from a special point of view. Here's what it looks like to us. On the outside, that's what you see. Um, and that means um, that any scientist who goes looking in the brain for what's now often called the neural correlate of consciousness, MCC, he's going to have his work cut out. Because the problem will be, of course, the scientist coming from the outside um, isn't, going to, simply isn't going to recognize the neural correlate of consciousness for what it is, even if it's right in front of him, observing this strange process in the brain or the equivalent of that, but not knowing how to look at it, he's never going to guess that he's cracked the problem, the hard problem of consciousness, and indeed should probably get the Nobel Prize. So my next question is, what actually is the process in the brain? What's it made of? Well, I suggest we should start by asking, what's it made from historically? If we now experience, oh, sorry, if we now experience this kind of magic chip on the did it come from originally? How did it start off? Well, I think the answer lies in the fact that sensations have always involved a kind of performance. In my account of this, which I've given at much more length in my earlier books, sensations arose early on in evolution as bodily activities, expressive responses to the stimuli arriving at our body. They're active, expressive. Imagine a primitive animal floating in the primeval ocean. Well, things are happening to it. Uh, chemicals are sticking to it. Pressures pushing up against it. Lights falling on it. Now, some of these things are going to be a good thing for that animal, and some of them are going to be bad. And so it'll react to one with an ouch, some, or the, to the other with the equivalent of a whoopee or a welcome. And these responses are just reflex bodily behaviors, riddles of rejection or acceptance. The animal reacts unconsciously to this stimulus with a skull, to that with a welcoming smile. To begin with, these responses are indeed just merely responsive. The animal is in no way mentally aware of the stimulus. However, suppose the animal were, want, were to want to actually know what's happening to it, to form a mental representation of the stimulation of the surface of its body. Well, a neat solution would be for it to monitor its own response. Since this reflex behavior potentially carries loads of information about the stimulus, about what it is, where it is, when it's happening, and with what import it has for the animal's own well-being. As I've argued, it, so it happened that these primitive animals, our ancestors, in the course of evolution, discovered 
They could indeed represent what's happening to them by monitoring what they themselves were doing about it. But things were never going to stay like that. The time was born to come in evolution when the original bodily responses were no longer appropriate as animals developed into different multicellular, complicated multicellular cell animals and so on. And of course, the cell biology changed. The animal no longer wanted to engage in overt bodily expression. But it still did still want to track the stimulation to represent what was happening to it. So what to do? The answer was for the responses to become internalized. So they're not now occurring at the body surface, but they're still occurring inside the brain, and they're still being they're still being mon monitored. You see the arrow shows that we're still monitoring our own responses. And so, to cut this story short, the upshot is that, that when today we experience sensory stimulation, we're still responding with something like ancient action patterns that were handed down from our ancestors. But now, these actions, these, these expressions have become virtual expressions, occurring at the level of a virtual body inside our own heads. Now indeed, the activities we're performing are indeed a kind of pantomime. Something whose purpose is no longer to do anything about the stimulus, but only to tell us about it. Let's take the case of seeing red. One I've written a lot about it, for example. Red light arrives at our eyes. And the next thing, behind the scenes, we make an effective response to it. Out of sight, of course. Now, this response is an active, effective response, an ongoing response. And so, I'll give it an active name. I'll say that what we're doing in response to that stimulus is ready. Um, but now, that's, an, that's a response. Where's the sensation in all of this? Sensation is our own response as monitored by introspection. To have the sensation of red is to find oneself ready. So you'll see sensation has always been theatre of a sort. Yet at the start, of course, it won't have been magical theatre. There's no reason to think that the show will have had any extraordinary magical illusion generating qualities. So then, what happened next? How did this become this? So that sensation did indeed become phenomenal, conscious, magical sensation. Well, having seen what the show evolved from, can we guess what it's made of? Well, it is a guess, but I think the answer lies in the process of privatization, which I've just described. What the privatization of sensory loops, um, sensory responses did, was to create the potential for, for feedback loops. As in the original situation, you're making a response actually at the body surface. Then the response becomes privatized, and now you're only making it inside your own brain. And of course, it begins to join up with itself so that you can get a, a feedback loop. And the thing about feedback loops is that when conditions are right for it, the activity can then become self-sustaining. Moreover, that sustained activity can take on very remarkable qualities. Suppose that each time the activity cycles around this loop. Suppose that the transmission character the waves passed on from there to there. Suppose that the way the signal is passed on is altered by the activity the previous time around. Then the de development will be described by a delay differential equation. Some of you in this audience know what I'm talking about. You don't need to know exactly what I mean. But what happens with the delay differential equations, it means that typically the activity in this loop will either develop chaotically, um, which will be uninteresting, or else it will settle into a so-called attractor state, in which the same pattern repeats itself indefinitely. The film clip shows an example of a developing pattern of an attractor in a feedback loop. Factor generated by those equations which describe activity in a circling loop. Um, and it's a rather simple one. 
This exists just in three dimensions. And here's another one in three dimensions. But the attractor will often turn out to be very much more complicated and, in fact, will occupy a higher dimensional landscape. And the number of additional dimensions can be very large indeed. In fact, there will be cases where it would, would require a graph with an infinite number of dimensions to describe the stable activity in a feedback loop, the attractor state. Difficult to take in, isn't it? Infinite number of dimensions simply to draw a graph of the attractor state. Well, if we want the potential for magic, then surely here we've got it. Um, suppose that natural selection in designing the sensory show had all those extra dimensions to play with. The mind boggles, uh, perhaps literally, the possibilities for creating objects. Let's now call them mathematical objects in the brain that, when monitored internally, could seem to have extraordinary out-of-this-world properties. But let me get more specific to try and illustrate that. If there's one thing that everyone who's thought about sensory consciousness has remarked on is its peculiar temporal characteristics. Imagine yourself looking at a cascading waterfall or listening to the song of a nightingale. Physical time is flowing linearly forward with no let-up in the relentless passage from instant to instant. But that's not how you experience it at the level of sensation. Rather, the present moment, the now of sensation, seems to hang on a little, as if each instance of sensation is still there for you for a brief period after you create it as if it happens for longer than it happens. So what's going on? What could possibly give rise to this illusion? Of course, it must be an illusion that the past is still present, as if you're living in thick time. As it happens, there's an answer we can take right off the peg. Douglas Hofstadter, the American philosopher, has pioneered the analysis of a special kind of feedback loop, which he calls a strange attractor, a strange, strange loop. His words, for someone observing the cyclic activity in such a loop, then in the series of stages that constitute the cycling around, there's a shift from one level of abstraction to another, and yet somehow the successive upward shifts turn out to give rise to a closed cycle. That is, despite one's sense of departing ever further from one's origin, one winds up to one's shock exactly where one had started out. Well, what might this be like for an observer? What if you had this behind the scenes? Well, if you want a visual spatial metaphor, it might be like this. Like climbing an endless staircase, it always takes you back to exactly the same place you set out. Or if you want an auditory metaphor, um, it might be like listening to a glissando, where the sound seems always to be rising in pitch without ever getting there. Listen to this. Sometimes I have to go on playing that to persuade people that the note is not changing. It sounds as if it's rising in pitch all the time. Um, so how might thick time, as I call it, arise from that? Well, look at it this way. If you climb the staircase and you end up exactly where you started out, then uh, we conventionally, exactly at the same height you started, you started out, we conventionally describe this as having traveled no distance up. But space and time are equivalent in this peculiar situation. So if you climb the staircase and end up exactly at the same place you set out earlier, then an equally good interpretation would be that you have passed no time. Indeed, imagine that you were to measure time by counting how many steps you've ascended. One second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, and so on. Fifteen seconds, no seconds. Go back where you started. Um, you'd have spent time without using time. Now, to translate that back to sensation, suppose that in responding to a sensory stimulus, you were to initiate activity in the feedback loop this attractor turned out to be just such a strange mathematical object. Then indeed, when you monitored yourself doing it, I think you might indeed find yourself having the experience of living in the thick moment of consciousness. At least, I can imagine it. 
the activity of reading here has taken on the new property of seeming to the subject to last in its own virtual time. Okay, so, well, of course, these ideas do need much more work, and I won't claim that we've actually cracked the hard problem yet, but I will claim that cracks are appearing. We're beginning to see the sort of solution that could do it. Um, and that's the difficult part of my lecture. Enough about what consciousness is made of. I want to devote the rest of the talk to that crucial question, what all this is for, what phenomenal consciousness is doing for us. We've plotted the route from primitive bodily sensations to a phenomenal sensation. Um, but why ever did natural selection take that route? I think that philosophers and scientists have asked this question have routinely missed the point because they've had completely the wrong expectations about what consciousness is doing. They've expected consciousness to be playing some kind of practical role in cognition or in intelligence. And then they've been puzzled because it doesn't seem to do that. Here's Jerry Fodor again. Consciousness seems to be among the chronically unemployed. As far as anybody knows, anything that our conscious minds could do, they could do just as well without it. Or just as well if they weren't conscious. Why then did God bother to make consciousness? Well, of course, Fodor is asking the right question. Why did God as we put it, natural selection. Why did, God, why did God bother? Well, you'll see that Fodor has assumed that consciousness must be providing us with some new kind of skill, helping us achieve some outcome that we can achieve only by virtue of being conscious. Like, say, a bird can fly only because it's got wings, or you can understand this sentence only because you know English, the English language. But as, I, as I've hinted already, I don't think the role of consciousness is like this at all. Let me say it again. Consciousness is theater. Its job is to change our outlook on life, to give us a new view of just who and what we are and what kind of world we live in. Well, how so? Uh, there's much to, uh, to discuss in the next half hour, but I'm going to give you a taste of how I think it works in human beings, at least. So, to start with, of consciousness. Maybe it is droit de vivre. In the process of becoming and remaining conscious, in the simple pleasure of being there, we discover a new purpose in our own existence. As Lord Byron wrote, the great object of life becomes sensation, to feel that we exist even though in pain. Or as a philosopher Tom Nagel has put the same point rather more soberly. There are elements which, if added to one's experience, make life better. There are other elements which, if added to one's experience, make life worse. But what remains when these are set aside is not merely neutral, it's emphatically positive. The additional positive weight is supplied by experience itself rather than by any of its consequences. Well, I think the word sensualism approaches but hardly does justice to this emotion. Maybe we need the word presentism. But at any rate, the emotion is a basic and familiar one. The yen to confirm and renew, in small ways or large, our own occupancy of the subjective moment. Listen to this letter from the poet John Keats. Talking of pleasure. This moment, I'm writing with one hand and with the other holding to my mouth a nectar. Good God, how fine. It went down soft. Pulpy, slushy, oozy, all its delicious plumpness melted down my throat like a large, beatified strawberry. Well, we see this kind of delight in simply being there. In animals as well, of course. I could give many, many examples, but here's one. Mark Bechoff. He writes, I once saw a young elk run across a snowfield, jump in the air and twist his body while in flight, stop, catch his breath, and do it again and again. Buffalo have been seen playfully running onto and sliding across the ice, excitedly bellowing as they do so. And if it were us, of course, it would certainly be the sense of its being like something to slide across the ice that would be providing the incentive. And who can doubt that it's the same is true, at least for some other animals? These bonobos are surely enjoying being themselves. 
have another lovely example which was shown on YouTube last year. What? Горки катаются. Она? Of course, that the crow is enjoying the process, enjoying being itself, and of course, because of a bush cut, it must be playing just the same. Um, but then here's the question why should feeling that we exist and valuing that feeling, why should that be biologically adaptive so that the underlying brain circuits? would have been selected in the course of evolution. Well, I think the answer, or at least the beginning of an answer, is right there in front of us. It is that a creature who takes pleasure in the feeling of existence will develop a will to exist. And so, at least in humans, a will to live. Now, admittedly, this might seem like something of a bootstrap operation. It's like, it could be like liking the sound of one's own voice. But why not if it works? We accept that nature made sex pleasurable to encourage us to have sex. Well, then why not make living magically delightful in order to encourage life, and at least in humans, to increase the fear of death? It's the American novelist Philip Roth in the interview. Yes, I am afraid of dying. I'm 72. What am I afraid of? Oblivion, of not being alive. Quite simply, of not feeling life, not smelling it. Um, Roth is contrasting oblivion with something else, something. And that something is provided by his sense of the theatrical space he occupies, living in the presence of sensations, feeling, smelling, that thick moment of consciousness. For of course, consciousness does more than merely bring delight gives us something substantive to hold on to, something to aim for, a ball to keep in the air. But that's just the start. Let me move on to the next level, which being consciousness dramatically changes people or people's outlook. I'll call that the enchantment of the world. Now let's note that simple joie de vivre, the joy in feeling life and smelling it, can often be thoroughly introverted, self-body-centered. It's the sensations in themselves that matter, not the feels and the smells, not the things in the world out there that give rise to them. And in fact, when basking in the present moment, we may choose deliberately to pull away from the world of the world outside to enjoy the sensations untroubled by reality. And of course, that's one of the purposes of abstract art, to deny the world and just to concentrate on the sensations. Here, Matisse has taken a table laden with dessert and he's abstracted the pure forms. British painter Bridget Riley has gone still further. Um, this is a painting from an exhibition of hers entitled According to Sensation. And in an interview with a journalist, she wrote, she said, um, just feel the light. Um, don't think about what's out there. Just feel this moment at your eye. But of course, at other times, and in other moods, our delight in being conscious Turns pointedly to delight, uh, to, to, to being pointedly to, to, to having delight in living in a very particular world of things. Here's the Dutch artist Dehem's painting on which Matisse based his abstract painting. Dehem has created not just a feast for the eyes, but he's drawn attention to the glories of the world as such the solid existence of the glittering silver and gold goblets, the plump fruits, the smooth linen the things as such. British poet Rupert Brooke does the same beautifully in verse. So in the poem charms actually for 150 lines. Here's something. These I have loved. White plates and cups clean gleaming, ringed with blue lines. In feathery fairy dust. Wet roofs beneath the lamp. The strong crust of friendly bread and many tasting food. Rainbows and the blue bitter smoke of wood. The benison of hot water, furs to touch, the good smell of old clothes, and other such. Oh, the list, as I said, is long, and the poet fondles each commonplace sensory delicacy like a bead on a rosary, 
Each item produces a thrill of recognition in us. Yes, we've made that. But whatever's going on here, why do such ordinary things seem so precious to a human being? Well, surely it's because some of the magic of sensations is rubbing off on those things out there. So that it seems to us as if the things out there in the world possess phenomenal qualities in their own right. As if the things as such have an extra dimension of presence. Now, of course, strictly speaking, this doesn't make sense. Qualities of sensations are our creation. No way do they belong out there in the external world. In the case of a red tomato, for example, it's the sensation of light at our eyes that has the phenomenon. Not the, not the tomato as such. The tomato is physically red, um, but not phenomenally red. Yet, here's the thing that happens. All our experience has been that red tomatoes and red sensations go together. Salty anchovies and salty sensations go together. Cold water and cold sensations go together. So it's hardly surprising then if the repeated association of the sensation with the perceived object provides the stimulus, is enough to give rise to the illusion that the sensation is actually a property of the object out there, so that the tomato itself acquires phenomenal properties. Well, there's no question when, when, when we project phenomenal qualities onto things in the world, we're making a philosophical mistake category mistake. But it's not going to matter. Philosophical quibbles aren't going to stop us when the result is so enchanting. Literally, things out there are getting enchanted and it's happening courtesy of our sensations, what we do. The connection becomes particularly obvious when the sensation is intensified. This can happen, for example, with psychotropic drugs. Here, Aldous Huxley describes his experience with medicine books with which my study walls were lined, glowed with brighter colors, profounder significance. Red books like rubies, emerald books, books bound in white jade, books of agate, black and aquamarine, of yellow topaz. Now, for sure, that's an exaggerated experience under mescaline, but what I want to say is, that actually, it happens all the time. Dull, perceptual objects become magical. Ordinary things glow with brighter colors with profound significance for all of us, without the risk. Borrowed phenomenality all the time transforms the world into an awesome place, a place all the more amazing because of the intimate connection we feel we have to it, a place where the things out there seem to be singing our song, as indeed they are. How often have we looked into a fire stared at a swirling pool and been knocked back by the impossible beauty of it, by our sense of union to the things out there. And there's every reason to think that this is a trait which we share with at least some of our non-human relatives. I looked at the stream, completely mesmerized by the pattern of the flow through his fingers. What's going through his mind? What, what? Every day. What suddenly changed about it? Well, <coughs> caption to uh, this, this illustration to this book, um, from a book called The Last Human, reads The Play of Light and Shadow Between Tree and Sun fills this Neanderthal man with a sense of awe. Well, why not a sense of awe in Neanderthals? And why not a sense of awe in chimpanzees? We've come from a history of animals which already began to feel a sense of awe. But then how does this attitude of awe affect survival? Well, it certainly puts us in a frame of mind to count our blessings. It's not just good to be alive, but we're alive, good to be alive in this astonishing world. Brook again, in a flicker of sunlight on a blank wall, 
or a reach of muddy pavement, or smoke from an engine at night. It's a sudden significance and importance and inspiration that makes the breath stop. It's a feeling that has amazing results. I suppose my occupation is being in love with the universe. Sentiment, I think, more often found in the mystics and in English poets. Well, if we want an adaptive function for consciousness, perhaps being in love with the universe will do. But more specifically, what's it translate into being in love with the universe? Love is a powerful emotion. It motivates us to engage with things, to investigate them, to make them, to go out and find them. The chimpanzee, as we saw, goes to the stream to find the sensations of cold and wet, of wetness on his fingers. How about this? I'm going to show you a dolphin blowing bubbles so as to relish the qualities which the dolphin himself is projecting onto his own creation. And of course, we humans are the same, but even more so. Because we d delight in the world which we ourselves have lit up by our own creativity, we've become creatures dedicated to play and exploration, with the result that simply by indulging our love affair with things, we learn ever more about the true potential of the world we live in. I saw itself as a monument to this very emotion, engaging with the world. A picture from that book, the juvenile Australopithecus greets the new morning two and a half million years ago. Well, why not? It's the emotion of every child on a spring morning. Where am I going? I don't quite know. Down to the stream with the king cups going. Up on the hill where the pine trees go. Anywhere. Anywhere. I don't know. Where am I going in the high rooks call? It's awful fun to be born at all. Well, I want to say that awful fun is not the half of it. The fact is that life in this world for conscious creatures can be unspeakably beautiful and interesting. And talking of spring mornings, I'll show you another film. But... We all know what that's like. So, Okay, I want to say that this increased interest in being in the world could alone be enough to explain the adaptive advantage of redesigning sensation to give it phenomenal qualities, at least for the first steps that have happened long ago, long before humans came on the scene. But for humans, there's also something else, a payoff on a much grander level still. We're going to do that self and self. We watch a song of this, for example. It's so amazing. But like the poet William Blake, we may be moved to insist on its supernatural origin. Um, what he asked, when the sun, well, imagine someone asking, when the sun rises, don't you see a run disk of fire, something like that? And he replies, oh, no, no, I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Another English mystic, Thomas Trahan, went straight to the paradoxical truth of this. By the very right of your senses, you'll enjoy the world. Does not the glory of the sun pay tribute to your sight? When we watch the sunrise, the sun, as I said, is singing our song. Oscar Wilde summed up the shocking but wonderful reality. It's in the brain that everything takes place. It's in the brain that the poppy is red, that the apple is odorous, that the skylark sings. Francis Crick, a hundred years later, called this the astonishing hypothesis. The astonishing hypothesis is that you are, in fact, no more than a behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells, that it's you who are responsible for all your conscious experience. Um, but actually, I don't think it's really so astonishing some level, we already know it. We know 
it's coming from us. Since we were children, we've all explored the wonders of subjectivity. Children are natural born philosophers. Back in the playground, we were already asking those deep questions, for example, about our own peculiar role in generating the world of phenomenal colors. Could the light of the sun that I experience as, as, as red be something which you experience as subjective blue, what I would, I would call subjective, subjective blue? We all ask these questions, even if we learn later not to, that they have no answers, but perhaps they do. How could, how could we even begin to ask these questions unless we'd already hit on that strange truth that all this glory is, in the end, really down to us? So I think we shouldn't take, indeed, take a high view of ourselves for being conscious. What am I doing here? What's it like to be the author behind the scenes of all this magical stuff? Well, it's like owning it, making it mine. Thomas Trahan, the, the, the mystic I mentioned, was actually much more radical in his film fantasies than the prim Victorians who made that stained glass window I showed. Uh, that they imagined. There's a new window dedicated to him. <coughs> That's more what he looked like. And here was what he was writing in 1670. The streets were mine. The temple was mine. The people were mine. Their clothes and gold and silver were mine. The skies were mine. And so were the sun and the moon and the stars. And all the world was mine. And I, the only spectator and enjoyer of it. Well, Traham, like Huxley, with his mescaline, is in a peculiar state of self-congratulation. Most people are much more laid back. We're used to it. We take it for granted. But what we're taking for granted is a kind of miracle. And for humans, it deeply shapes our sense of self. Well, how so? In many ways, but I want to concentrate on one in, one in particular. What is the most psychologically salient property of conscious sensation? Well, surely it's just this. Trahan's obsession that it belongs to me. The sensation belongs to me and me alone. I am indeed the sole spectator and enjoyer. Now, the idea that what we're doing is entirely logically private may indeed be an illusion, a um, consequence of the way it gets set up with us having just this one privileged viewpoint on it. But psychologically, this privacy is hugely impressive, creating the irresistible idea of myself, as a separate bubble of consciousness. And how does that affect people psychologically? I'd say it encourages us to believe, as we never would do otherwise, in our own metaphysical importance. Each individual human being is indeed a focal singularity within the universe. Bill Halicare said, at least in the modern British philosophy, that there's no such thing as a self that individualism is a recent invention, that no man is an island entire of himself. Yet the fact is that at the deepest level of experience, uh, people describe, discover the exact opposite. They're not these islands. Um, sorry, there they are, they, they are, are these islands of consciousness. They're, they are islands entire of himself. Um, and when it comes to it, every man is only knows it what he feels from the inside. Well, I said that consciousness as theater affects our outlook on life. Here's a big enough effect. But how could, could this in reality be one of the reasons why consciousness has been favored by natural selection to make us feel private, internalized, out of touch? Well, in some ways, maybe yes. Um, could that have been biologically important? My maybe an unfashionable view, but whatever the bad press from philosophers and relativists and ethicists, but no hesitation in saying that individualism at this level, selfism, represents a real step up in the life game. There's William James writing on the subject before it became politically incorrect to talk about individualism in this way. The altogether unique kind of interest which each human mind feels in those parts of creation which it can call me or mine may be a moral riddle, but it is a fundamental psychological no mind can take the same interest in his neighbor's need as in his own. And the self-interest and self-importance that follows from this is indeed immensely empowering. 
as conscious creatures, we humans have become naturally the kind of beings who aspire not only to be ourselves through continually affirming our presence in the world, but to make more of ourselves through learning, creativity, symbolic expression, spiritual growth, social influence, and indeed through the love of others. Uh, now, maybe you think I shouldn't bring the love of, love of others here. I've, in here. I said that consciousness separates and isolates us. One level, it certainly does. It promotes individualism. Yes, it certainly does. But that's not the end of the story. And what happens next makes up for all that narcissism. Because the fact is that from soon after our discovery as infants of the glories of being me, we humans are led to a daring speculation about the selves of other people. If I myself have this astonishing phenomenon at the center of my existence, then isn't it likely, even certain, that the same holds for other people? So what's that say about then about the kind of creatures that we humans collectively are? It's not just me. Every one of us is a hub, creative hub of consciousness. All men have been endowed by the creator with an inalienable and inviolable mind space of their own, just as special, just as private, just as precious and important to them as mine is to me. Trahan delightedly expressed this side of things. You never enjoy the world or right till you perceive yourself to be the sole heir of the whole world, and more than so, because men are in it who are, everyone, sole heirs as well. As you think about that extraordinary paradoxical ourselves. You're the sole heir to the world. Everyone else is also the sole heir to the world. Well, we are indeed, as I would say, a society of sounds. The idea is extraordinarily potent, psychologically, ethically, politically. And I dare say, from the moment it took off among our ancestors, it must have been highly adapted biologically adaptive. In fact, I go so far as to say that this change in spiritual worldview marked a watershed in the evolution of our species. None of our ancestors saw it like that. Tatiana Matsutawa's chimpanzees when he was talking about earlier this week. They don't have that sense of their own interiority and yet the idea that others equally experience that kind of private world of consciousness. Um, and I think it's the point at which humans first began to treat other humans as persons of equal status to themselves, independent, private, respectable, responsible, free-willed, low-seed of phenomenal consciousness. Everyone, a soul in good standing, a soul the equal of our own. That's the first time I've used that word soul in my talk. Should I really be using a word like that? Doesn't it carry too much baggage? Yes, it does carry a lot of baggage, and I think that's precisely why I, as a scientist, should still be entitled to use it. Um, theologian Keith Ward wrote, the whole point of talking of the soul is to remind ourselves constantly that we transcend all the conditions of our material existence. We transcend them precisely in being indefinable, always more than can be seen or described, subjects of experience and action, unique and irreplaceable. So here's where I'm driving. For members of the human species to live in a world where people in general have this opinion of themselves is to live in what we can call the soul niche. I mean niche or niche. Now, in the conventional ecological sense of that term, it's an environment to which a species has become adapted and where it's designed to flourish. Trout live in rivers. Gorillas live in forests. Bedbugs live in beds. Humans live in soul land. Soul land is a territory of the spirit. It's a place where the magical interiority of human minds makes itself felt on every side. A place where we naturally assume that everyone else, um, that everyone, every, every other human being lives as we do in the extended present of phenomenal consciousness. Where we recognize and celebrate awesome possibilities of individual private joy and suffering. 
It's a place where the fate of one's own and other people's souls is a constant talking point, where souls are the subject of gossip, of tender concern, of mean speculation, of manipulation by prayer and by spells. It's a place where the claims of the spirit begin to rank just as highly as the claims of the flesh, where we join hands with others in sharing the beauties of the world which we ourselves have enchanted. I could go on in this vein, but especially for an Indian audience, I'm sure I don't need to. You live there, and so on. You know. And the consequence of that was? Well, the consequence is that we humans have been set up by nature to dwell on those eternal questions. Where have we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Consciousness sets up these questions. But it also begins to answer them. And it's been in us asking and answering these questions that our species, as a biological entity, has raised itself nearly to the level of the gods. But you might ask, do humans really need to ascend to the level of the gods? I've been told by Dan Dennett, my friend, for example, that this hypothesis, that consciousness has evolved just so as to give us this inflated idea of ourselves. That idea, this idea is functionally extravagant. It makes out consciousness to be the solution to a non-problem, so he said. Well, I don't think so. You might just as well object that birds don't need to fly. Terrestrial animals were doing just fine before any of them thought of taking to the air, taking to the sky. Flight, you might say, was the solution to a non-problem. Yet wings and flight opened up a new world for birds to exploit. And looking at the history of human beings over the last 100,000 years, I think we can say that angels' wings did the same for us. Well, I say 100,000 years. Can we begin to guess when this development came about, historically? I think, actually, that there may be some clues to be found in archaeology, and I'm sure many more still to come. But here's one which struck me. In the village of Villafarnish, in the Valencia region of Spain, there are some rock paintings in a cave just below the castle, um, which date to about 15,000 years BC. When I visited the cave a few years back, I was taken aback to see the resemblance between one of these images and the drawing, it's an image from the cave, resemblance between that and a drawing I'd made earlier in a scientific journal to illustrate the privatization of sensation. Well, I wonder, was this painting on the rock, in fact, um, an early Neolithic representation and celebration of what it means to have a self? If so, let me take that speculation a bit further. What about all those other spirals and cups and rings within rings? Designs seem everywhere to speak so strongly of interiority. But these are, they're a recurring theme in rock art, wherever, just, wherever human beings have settled, Asia, Australia, America, even indeed in Cambridge, England, for example, recently discovered from tens of thousands of years ago. Archaeologists have no good theories of what, what such symbols are about. It's been suggested that a multiple representation, like this one from Ireland, is some kind of field plan. Well, with due reservation, due reservation, I don't think this is a field plan. This is a soul plan. This, this is a Bronze Age version of this. This is telling us about what people here live souls. Well, I know I'm running out of time, but I can't leave this up. Here live souls. But today, we must probably say, here lived souls. What's certain is that the human beings who made those marks on the rock are here no longer. The marks on the rock persist. The individual people do not. Solar, I have to say, is dangerous territory. There's just the eagle who once slashed a little child off the earth. You know the reasons why living on this earth always has spiritual. I showed you my son in the waves. On the hillside above this beach in Ireland. So we've got rock in the background. 
the suit here, on the hillside above, are the graves of local people who must have played in those same ways a few hundred years before. One of those graves was open. And so I looked inside. The problem is that the higher you climb, the harder you fall. As the future of the individual, individual self has acquired ever greater psychological significance in the course of human evolution, so the death of the self must surely become an ever greater tragedy. It's a tragedy not just for the one person who loved himself, but a tragedy for the others who loved him too. The particular person is gone. The very person whose consciousness and intellect were designed by nature to make him believe himself a being of such singular importance. We can hardly underestimate the loss of the world. Russian poet Yevgeny Yevtushenko said it for us beautifully. No people are uninterested. Their fate is like the chronicle of planets. Nothing in them is not particular, and planet is dissimilar from planet. In any man who dies, there dies with him his first snow and kiss and fight. Not people die, but worlds die. In them. George Steiner, English literary critic, is called death a scandal. Individual souls surely deserve better than to be snuffed out in less than a hundred years after their arrival on Earth. But I suppose it's true that if we can think like detached evolutionary scientists, we ought to be able to reconcile ourselves to death, theoretically. Because we'll recognize that this has always been nature's way. Um, individual survival has never been the main concern of biological evolution. What's mattered is the survival of genes and germlines. In fact, Evolutionary progress would come to a stop <coughs> if individuals could live forever. Perhaps we don't have to be scientists to think like this to some extent. Non scientists, too, of course, can surely take comfort from the idea of cultural continuity. The thought that even if our individual selves can't survive, we can still have some sort of presence after death through the things we've left behind, especially through the lasting effects we've had on other people's lives. As the guy, Janta and Lauren, told us yesterday, these caves were made by people to immortalize themselves. Um, well, maybe we can take comfort in that. But Woody Allen, for one, was having none of it. He said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work, work, work but I need not read his minds. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and wanting to live on in his apartment, also known as Woody Allen's body, Allen surely speaks the deepest language of the embodied human soul. There are no two ways about it. As conscious creatures, we have been selected, designed, to consider death the ultimate betrayal. <laughs> So what's the way out, if there is one? Could consciousness itself provide a way out? Well, perhaps the fact that the human species is still here, and that our ancestors did not find the prospect of death totally soul-destroying, that's living proof that humans did find a way out. Indeed, as I describe in my book at some length, I have time to tell you now, I think consciousness did actually have one more trick on its sleeve. Nature gave us natural souls, common or garden, spiritual presence in the world. But in doing so, she paved the way for human culture to come up with the idea of a supernatural soul, an out of this world soul, a soul that goes on living in some fashion, even after the body has turned to dust. And in the tradition of this country, of course, the idea has been revived again and again. So, but also I should say, and I come from, we can be sure, indeed, even in Ireland, that the individuals buried beneath those tombs above the beach, they went to their deaths with full ex expectation that, they, that their bodies and their minds would be resurrected somewhere else. Uh, perhaps this isn't 
quite the solution that Woody Allen was asking for. But nonetheless, if you can't live on in Manhattan, you could do worse than to live on as an angel. Okay, I'll leave it with you there.